of writers like Thomas Hobbes, who wrote in Leviathan chapter 45 that of demonology and other reliquies of the religion of the Gentiles, he discounted by providing a materialist explanation of apparitions of spirits by an analogy with the way in which violent pressure on the eye produces an illusion of bright light. Hobbes had a cynical view of human nature and human institutions, including religious institutions, and his ideas were perceived to be dangerously influential in the late 17th century England, when ideas like these could spread across the courts and inns and the coffee houses of Restoration London. So with this pushback against Enlightenment thinkers like Hobbes, this is where a popular belief in royal touch really takes root. Now let's dig more into the history of the royal touch and what it looked like in practice. Like I mentioned at the top of this episode, the first recorded healing of scrofula by an English king was Edward the Confessor in the event where he heals a woman with protruding glands and he washes and rubs the afflicted parts, causing them to drain and the woman recovers within a week. William of Malmesbury said this was a result of the king's sanctity. It was a saint's miracle, not just because he was king. But soon, the power of the royal touch was linked to the anointing of the king at his coronation, and other English kings began to heal the scrofulas. This practice of anointing kings at their coronation had been borrowed from the Franks in the 9th century. It mimicked how, when priests were induced into the clergy, hands were laid upon them when they adjoined the magisterium. This practice of laying hands and anointing the kings at the coronation also comes with the custom of employing a bishop to do the crowning. This marks the investment of the king with a sacred character, where the ceremonies of the church were appropriated by the monarchy. William of Ockham, who lived from 1285 to 1347, wrote a treatise extolling royal power at the expense of papal power, that through unction, kings receive the grace of spiritual gifts, citing the power of English kings to heal scofula as proof. This comes as the Middle Ages march on and we enter the High Middle Ages, Kings have a sacred character that they didn't have in the same way in the early Middle Ages. The practice of royal unction of this coronation of kings was similar to the practice of anointing the hands of a priest at his ordination. And the connection was explicit. At the coronation of Kings James I and Charles I, royal unction was likened to the anointing by God of kings, prophets, and priests in the Old Testament. Unction emphasized the belief that the king was God's agent, like a prophet or a priest. Now, this was a feature of coronation rites throughout Europe, but France and England were different, because only here were the kings anointed with the oil of catechumens and with chrism. Chrism, also called myrrh, is a consecrated oil that's used in many different churches in the administration of certain sacraments and also ecclesial functions. So, over time, writers thought that this power to heal wasn't because of the holy nature of the king, but because of their anointing ceremony. Sir John Fortescue, who wrote in 1462, said, The kings of England, at their very anointing, received such an infusion of grace from heaven that by touch of their anointed hands, they cleanse and cure those infected with the king's evil. This gift is not bestowed on queens, the spouses of remaining monarchs, as they are not anointed on the hands. This was the practice of the early modern period, with the coronation of Charles and his wife, only her head and chest were anointed, not her hands. But later on, queens are recognized with having this ability. The idea of royal healing became widely accepted in English life. It was a political act and a religious ritual, and it was tied to the medieval church. And that's why it's interesting that even though it's considered strictly a religious practice, it survives the religious revolutions of the 16th century. The royal healing flourished despite the present Reformation suspicion of healing rites and sacraments of the church. The suspicion reshaped much of the rest of English life. The practice of anointing the sick was eliminated in the prayer book revision of 1552, and it never returned. But due to its political utility, the royal healing continued to be practiced. Elizabeth I was reluctant to continue the royal healing, and Henry Stubb, who wrote 100 years after her reign, said, this was due to a fit of Puritanism that afflicted her, making her doubt the healing power of laying hands on the sick to heal them. But the power of royal healing gained importance after Elizabeth was excommunicated by the Catholic Church in 1570. She revived the royal healing, Stubb said, because of the charge leveled by Catholics that God had withdrawn the gift of healing from her 
due to her apostasy from Rome. So Elizabeth took pains to attribute the power of healing not to herself, but to God. This was a difference. She's quoted by William Tooker as having said to a crowd of Scrofulus and Gloucester, Oh, that I were able to bring you help. God is the greatest and most perfect physician of all. He is Jehovah, wise and holy, who will help your disease. It is necessary to pray to him. People interpreted this as a renunciation of the royal gift, but the queen intended merely to give proper honor to God as the source of the cure, and before leaving the county, she performed a mass healing. And one observer took pains to attribute the power not to the queen, but to God, with the monarch serving as an instrument of divine power. Hey everyone, Scott here. We're going to take a very short break for a word from our sponsors. James I also continued the practice of healing. Even though he had a Calvinist upbringing, he found the ritual a useful assertion of his claim to a foreign throne. Shakespeare's Macbeth offers a look at James I's attitude towards the royal touch. It contains a reference to the practice of royal healing. In Act 4, Scene 3, the character Malcolm describes what he saw at the court of Edward the Confessor. "'Tis called the evil, a most miraculous work in this good king, which often since my here remain in England, I have seen him do. How he solicits heaven, himself best knows, but strangely visited people, all swollen and ulcerous, pitiful to the eye. The mere despair of surgery he cures." hanging a golden stamp about their necks, put on with holy prayers and tis spoken, to the succeeding royalty he leaves, the healing benediction, with the strange virtue he hath a heavenly gift of prophecy. I mentioned earlier in this episode that it wasn't just England, but also France that believed in the royal touch. But English authors only allowed the power to those who could claim kinship with the royal house of England. According to French writers, their kings had held the power much longer and that they had performed the right from the reign of Clovis I. Whatever the difference between the two, the act of ceremony grows over the centuries. There wasn't much ceremony that went along with the healing till the reign of Henry VII, who instituted a special service and presented a special coin with the image of an angel to the sick persons. It was a gold piece of the value of six shillings and eight pence, and it derived its name from the device of St. Michael slaying the dragon, and it was suspended around the patient's neck by a white ribbon. Under the Tudors, the practice increased in frequency, and there's good reason to believe that the giving of this coin with the angel was responsible for this. After the reign of Elizabeth, the size of the gold piece was reduced, James I and Charles I sometimes giving silver. The latter monarch, during difficult times in the English Civil War, sometimes gave no coins at all, and there was one case where a young man brought a shilling with him for the king to hang around his neck. But after the restoration, pieces of smaller size than the old coin were minted for this purpose and are known as touch pieces. Queens also got involved in the royal touch, starting with Mary I and Elizabeth, in spite of Sir John Fortescue's observation of the inability of queens to cure the evil. A description of the ceremony in Mary's time was preserved in a contemporary letter. The writer, after describing the ceremonies of Monday Thursday, proceeds. The next day she went to bless the person's scrofulous, but she chose to perform this act privately in a gallery, where there were not above 20 persons. She caused one of the infirm women to be brought to her when she knelt and pressed with her hands on the spot where the sore was. This she did to a man and three women. She then made the sick people come up to her again and taking a golden coin, an angel, she touched the place where the evil showed itself, signed it with the cross, and passed a ribbon through the hole which had been pierced in it, placing one of them around the neck of each of the patients, and making them promise never to part with that coin, save in case of extreme need. During Elizabeth's time, the ceremony appears to have taken place in a church. Under James I, there was an enormous increase in the number of touchings that took place. He said to have touched 800 people at a time so that a reduction in the size of the gold piece had to be done. In connection with the Charles I, there are some interesting legends. One story goes that Richard Cole, an innkeeper at Winchester, was badly afflicted with scrofula. There was no medicine available, 
and the sufferer relied upon a bottle of lotion to keep the sores clean till he could obtain the benefits of the royal touch. On the removal of the kings from the Isle of Wight, the king passed through Winchester, and Cole, who was not allowed to approach Charles, succeeded in attracting his attention. I see that thou art not permitted to come near me, cried the king, and I cannot tell what thou wouldest have, but God bless thee and grant thy desire. The legend says that afterwards the man returned to the use of his lotion, and it appeared that the bottle became scaled, and on its sides there were many botches that appeared, and as these effects appeared in the vessel, the man's face and throat healed with the same speed. After this, a gentlewoman who saw the bottle attempted to pick off some of the sores, and the places which had been affected in his throat gave him new trouble. Charles was not only able to cure the evil when alive, but some believed that bloodstained relics removed from the scaffold were long held to possess the same power. The shirt and watch which he wore at the time of his death were preserved in the church at Ashburnham, and even as late as the 19th century, members of the Sussex peasantry, who were afflicted with scrofula, used to go there to be healed. The mania for royal touch reached its height in the reign of Charles II, who ruled from 1660 onward in the restoration of the monarchy after the English Civil War. The practice attained its maximum. During his reign, over 90,000 people accepted the royal touch. One reason that so many came to him and so many people sought out the royal touch was that during the Civil War and the absence of the monarchy, many people believed that without the royal presence, they couldn't receive healing. And with his restoration, many people sought to make up for lost time. The enormous crowd sometimes led to consequences. On May 28, 1684, one recorded that there was so great a concourse of people with their children to be touched for the evil that six or seven were crushed to death at the church's door for tickets. The first time the ceremony was performed after the restoration was on July 6, 1660, and took place in the banqueting hall at Whitehall. The king was sitting under a canopy of state. Over time, so many people came that a proclamation was issued that only those should apply who brought a certificate to the effect that they had not been touched before. Times of public healing were advertised, and in the public intelligencer appeared the following advertisement on May 14, 1664. Whitehall, his sacred majesty, having declared it to be his royal will and purpose to continue the healing of his people for the evil during the month of May, and then to give over till Michaelmas next, I am commanded to give notice thereof that the people may not come up to town and lose their labor. Another proclamation dated January 9th, 1683, said that the times of public healing shall from henceforth be from the Feast of All Saints till a week before Christmas, until the first day of March, being times most convenient for the temperature of the season and in respect of the contagion. Well, since we're in the time period of Charles II in the 1680s, I want to come back to why it reaches its height at a time that's especially marked by the attention to scientific inquiry. This is the time of Boyle and Locke, of Isaac Newton, and King Charles himself was interested in scientific research and patronized the Royal Society. What did surgeons of the time think about the miraculous healing powers claimed by the sovereign? Richard Wiseman, who was sergeant surgeon to the king, recorded his views. In his treatise on wounds, published in 1672, he writes, I wonder so little hath been written by the surgeons of the English and French courts, both which kings do so publicly exercise themselves in the cure of it. And here he's talking about scrofula. And though so many thousands of people pass through the hands of the surgeons to be judged of and presented to their princes, yet excepting, yet there is nothing appears in printing concerning it. In his work, Several Surgical Treatises, published in 1676, he devotes a fourth book to the king's evil of scrofula. The disease he describes as a tumor arising from a peculiar acidity of the serum of the blood, which, whensoever it lights upon glandule, muscle, or membrane, it coagulates and hardens when it mixes with marrow, always dissolves it and rottens the bone. He then devotes uh, 60 folio pages to descriptions of treatment, including incision, excision, cauterization, and medicinal methods. And he eventually has a sarcastic rejoinder that if the royal touch were really efficacious and really worked, why should the patients be put to the torment of other measures? 
But then he discusses in all seriousness the need of the giving of the pieces of gold of the coins with the angels on them to those who receive the royal 